All right, good morning, everyone. All right, that's the excitement I like to hear. Hopefully, some more coffee, and then we'll do that again afterwards. Um, so, welcome to One Million Cups. My name is Zach Pettit. This is our wonderful One Million Cups team here. This is the wonderful Milton. We got to call him out specific. He wasn't here last week having some back troubles, so make sure he's doing okay before you leave today. Wonderful Anna Welchman with Launch Code. And then this is the first week for the magnanimous Stephanie Home from Think Viral. So big round of applause for her. And yes, you are magnanimous. So welcome. Uh, the One Million Cups is an entrepreneurial program founded by the Kauffman Foundation where two entrepreneurs are going to come up, present their business, present their problem, and then you're going to have a chance to ask them follow-up questions and try and poke holes. So to start us out, I want to introduce our beautiful, wonderful panelists, and I'll pass it over to you to explain who you are. I'm Mindy Hart with Essential Foundations for Business, and I help you look at your organizational structure and development to make sure that all of your marketing tools are in alignment. Morgan Perry from Square One at Mid-Continent Public Library. We are a free service that goes to the small business or entrepreneur, teaches you how to access our databases, super hardcore, nerdy, deep internet stuff for free. <laughs> Love it. All right, well, we're going to kick it off with Mighty Handle. Ben, come on up. Good morning, my name is Ben Rendo. Uh, my company is Mighty Green, and our first product we have launched to the market is Mighty Handle. Uh, Mighty Green is headquartered uh, proudly in Kansas City, Kansas. If you know where KU Med is, we are directly across the street. Uh, my co-founder Anita Newton and I started the company in 2013, and our goal is to create, uh, manufacture, and bring to market innovative consumer products that make life better for shoppers and consumers across the U.S. Uh, Mighty Handle was really born out of a problem I faced. In uh, 2006, I had been transferred back from St. Louis to Kansas City, uh, where I grew up, and for about five months, uh, I lived in a walk-up apartment uh, while my wife and I were building a house. So every week, I would go grocery shopping. I would come home, open the trunk of my Jeep, and the groceries had tipped out and be spilled everywhere. So I'd get everything wrapped up again and then try to just crab claw and sherpa them up multiple flights of stairs. And so by the time I got to my front door, my hands, fingers, and forearms would be red and on fire from those little bag loops cutting into my skin. And I thought there had to be a better way, and that's kind of how I came up with Mighty Handle. Uh, Mighty Handle simply is just a handheld companion that uh, helps you to easily carry your groceries. Uh, it also works great for your dry cleaning, so uh, when you guys come out of the dry cleaners, if you've got the hangers on all your fingers, Mighty Handle easily will take the stress and strain off your hands. It's great for paint cans, and uh, one feature that we're very proud of is our twist lock feature. So if you've ever been driving home, you come to a sudden stop or you take a wide turn, and you just hear that whoosh, and the groceries roll all throughout your trunk. Uh, with our twist lock feature, all you do is, with your Mighty Handle, set down in your trunk, turn clockwise twice, and then flip the handle over. And when you're doing that turning motion, it'll cause the bag loops to lock up and snake around uh, the base of Mighty Handle. And then when you flip it over, it provides a lock. Uh, this just shows our merchandising. Uh, this is our countertop display. Uh, this is our clip strip. Uh, we launched the company in 2013. Uh, and. Uh, Essentially, just an idea to try to create new products. Uh, Altair Bank gave us a line of credit uh, which, when we had no business in getting one, uh, but they believed in us, uh, which is something I'm forever grateful for. So we started uh, selling in Schnooks, uh, started selling online, and at this point, we were we were pretty much grassroots hustling, you know, bottom of the barrel to make it work. Uh, we would get orders online. Uh, my wife and I, or Anita and uh, her wonderful kids, she would force them to do packaging, and then we would ship them uh, out to our customers. Uh, and so uh, it's hard when you don't really know, you know, am I going the right direction, am I going the right way? Uh, but within, 
under th uh, a little under three years, uh, we've grown to a seven-figure company. Uh, we're now sold in Walmart, uh, Bed Bath & Beyond, Kroger. Uh, by the end of next month, if you go into any of Walmart's 4,600 stores across the U.S., you'll be able to find Mighty Handle. Uh, it's something we're very proud of. Uh, but something that uh, I really wanted to kind of touch on today is, uh, you know, to tell you the story, don't give up. Uh, you know, as, as entrepreneurs and, you know, startup people, you know, we're facing a mountain of, <laughs> just a, a mountain of potential problems, potential risk, uh, you know, potential opportunities. Uh, and you never really know, uh, I should say for myself, don't know if you're going the right direction. Uh, but I'm a big believer in uh, taking leveraged risk uh, and taking smart chances. Uh, and so, you know, if you ever feel like, uh, you know, I'm ready to cash in and I, I want to get out, this isn't going to work, uh, I want to share a story uh, about how our company uh, kind of took off. Uh, in the summer of 2014, uh, Walmart put out a open call uh, to U.S. manufacturers. So. They said we want to buy about 250 billion worth of U.S. goods in the coming years, uh, and we want to look at new products. Uh, so uh, my friend Rick Kreska uh, owns a company called Ink Cycle, and they produced ink and toner for Sam's Club, and so they got on this invite list. And so Rick passed the invite on to me. Uh, so uh, for us, you know, right now we're selling in a hundred stores. Uh, you know, we've got just a handful of, of you know distribution points. For us, this is a Super Bowl. Uh, so we shot a video with uh, Walmart shoppers. Uh, had them talk about their experience before carrying and transporting their groceries and their experience after. Uh, they talked about the bags cutting into their hands and just simply how much better it, it you know, might have handled made their life. Uh, and so we drive down to Bentonville and we were pumped. You know, we were ready to dominate this presentation. And uh, we showed it to our buyer, uh, who was a, a wonderful woman, uh, but she just didn't, she didn't get the product. She didn't like the product. And, uh, we were pretty much shown the door like that. Uh, so the drive from Bentonville back to Kansas City uh, was probably one of the lower points in uh, my last few years. Uh, but that evening, my co-founder Anita said, uh, I'm, I'm not giving up. Uh, so she looked up the CEO of Walmart US. She didn't know him from Adam. Uh, she just knew that their email format was first name dot last name at walmart.com. Sent him an email, uh, said, you know, thank you for your hospitality at the summit today. We had such a great time. We loved meeting your associates. Uh, while it's highly unlikely uh, your stores are going to carry our products, we just wanted to share some consumer pain points with you. Uh, and miraculously, this guy actually opened the email at 6 a.m. the next day. Uh, said, I like this product. I think we should carry it. Uh, and so that pretty much set off a chain reaction where we got into a test of 100 stores. Uh, we uh, knocked it out of the park, went into 800 stores, killed it, went into 2,500, and now we're in 4,600, uh, including all of our retail distributions. We're in over 7,000 uh, stores across the United States and also on the Home Shopping Network. Uh, so, you know, when you feel like, you know, this is the end and I, I'm not going to make it, uh, you know, my, my suggestion is bear down, you know, keep doing the next right thing and, uh, you know, great things can happen. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. We're going to hand it off to our panelists to start with the questions uh, before we take it to the audience. I've got a couple questions before I hand it to Morgan because I know she'll never give me the microphone back. <laughs> um, the first thing is um, I want to know, since you were here before, what lessons have you learned since then and what challenges might still be out there? And then the next question is, you've got people that are buying it. Do you have any data about people that are actually continuing to use it on an ongoing basis? Uh, to answer your first question, uh, kind of what we've learned, uh, everything takes longer than I want it to, everything costs more than I want it to, and everything's going to be twice as hard. Uh, so. And I still don't do a very good job of this, but it's kind of learning to live in the ambiguity of the situation. You know, is it gonna? Are we gonna get uh, you know this new customer? Are we gonna get this rollout, or you know, are they gonna shoot us down? And while I'm just kind of living in that in between time, you know, 
not stressing, not being a miserable person to be around, you know, just kind of enjoying the moment. Uh, as far as data uh, of consumers reusing them, uh, we don't have any specific metrics other than, you know, we, we get quite a bit of uh, emails, post our social media from people tell us how much they like them. Uh, but as far as, you know, if they use it once, do they use it 10 times, that, that I can't answer. Thank you for sharing the story about how hard it gets and that sometimes it works out okay even when everybody's like, no, you should stop this. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I have a question and maybe this is what the woman in Bittenville was kind of thinking of. I will, no one will ever hear me deny the buying power of middle class white ladies, ever. They spend a lot of money on stuff. But is this, are these pain points just headaches or are they migraines? Like in Diana Kander's book, she talks a lot about, and if you've seen her speak, picking up dog poop sucks, but is it worth buying a solution to that problem? Sure. And what, how can you, who in this, who could potentially buy this where it really is a migraine for them, not just a, oh, my hand hurts. Yep. Like, is it the elderly? Who is that? Our, our customers uh, that, uh, you know, is it, kind of your good point, you know, is it a vitamin or, you know, is it a painkiller? Uh, the ones who it is a painkiller for are your people who live in urban areas. And I'm not saying just like your Chicago's, your DC's, your New York's, and even Kansas City, who live in walk-up apartments uh, or just live in regular condos who are taking the elevator up and down, uh, taking multiple trips. You know, your, your suburban mom uh, who has a baby on one arm is trying to crowd two more kids and get them inside. Uh, that kind of depends, you know, if she wants to be able to get everything in uh, and do it a little bit faster. The uh, thing is, our, our price point is pretty attractive to the point that even if the customer uh, says, you know what, uh, uh, this is a vitamin, it's not a painkiller, it's not going to be something that they're going to have real buyer's uh, remorse on. So when I look at your website, it looks like it's only for Johnson County stay-at-home moms. Mm -hmm. So maybe adding some of those those real people from Walmart and getting those on the website and moving that order now to a place where it can really be seen. Because I thought I was just looking at, I wasn't looking at something to purchase because I couldn't see it. Gotcha. One last question for me. I have five kids that are adults and five fifth grandbaby on the way. So I am that mom that's schlepping a ton of stuff. Yep. Um, but at that moment when I need it, it's probably still in the house from my last trip. So how do we address that issue? To, because if it's in the house, it does me no good. Sure. Uh, and that's a hard thing. Uh, a lot of our customers say that they keep in their purse. The size is small enough that it's something that you can easily fit into your purse. Uh, so it's going to go with you wherever you go. Because that, that is an issue that we face, that uh, people like using them, but you know, they get to the store and they realize it's sitting in a drawer at home. Uh, so we try to make it small enough that for a man it can fit in your pocket, uh, for a woman you know, she can drop it in her purse, and it's something easily you can transport with you. All right, I think we're going to go ahead and open it up to the crowd right after we have a question from the tweeter. Um, Bob King asks, what functions, I guess we'll go with do, I'm going to mess with the Syntax here a little bit. Uh, which function does Mighty Handle outsource? And how big is the company now? Uh, Mighty Handle outsources everything. Oh, uh, boom. Okay. Mighty Green uh, is uh, a company of uh, three people. We outsource our financing. Uh, I'm sorry, we outsource our financials. Uh, we outsource our manufacturing. Uh, we outsource the packaging. Uh, we focus on uh, creating the products. Uh, selling them, branding them, and uh, making them uh, something that's going to benefit the consumer. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a, a uh, I'm not a packaging uh, expert. You know, I'm, I'm not an expert in manufacturing. Uh, so I want to partner with companies uh, that can do that. Uh, and then, as far as uh, our size, we're we're privately held, so we we keep that to ourselves. That's fair. Number of employees? Uh, we have three employees. Okay, uh, I think that was the general question, but. And we got one in the middle. Great story. Um, I think this is good for me because it encourages me to hang in there. Uh, the only issue I would have, it's not twice as hard, but 
maybe 10 or 100 or 1,000 even in some places. Yeah. Um, how, uh, since this is your second presentation, you may have covered this in your first, but what was your process of actual development and or are you getting feedback uh, that gives you ideas on how to improve on this idea? Sure, that's a great question. Uh, the process was uh, when I first uh, kind of developed the idea for it, uh, the gentleman I, I talked about earlier, Rick, uh, let me sit down with one of his engineers and uh, flesh out a very rudimentary prototype. Uh, after I had that, uh, I took it to a company called Mission Plastics that's in Grandview, Missouri, and uh, they helped me design the actual product uh, that we would submit for patent. Uh, once we had that, uh, my partner Anita put together our branding, our messaging, our positioning, our packaging, uh, and we started selling online. Uh, our first version of packaging at Schnucks, uh, when we first rolled the product out, uh, I'm embarrassed about. Uh, so I think it's good to bring something to market so you can figure out how do I iterate and make this better. And in fact, the first Mighty Handle was about two inches larger than the current version. Our feedback from consumers were, you know, if I'm 5'2 and shorter, my bags might drag on the ground. So we wanted to make it more compact. Got another question here in the middle. All I gotta say is congratulations and bravo for the success. Especially hearing no's multiple times. I know it, it could be painful. But however, my question is, how, has the how have you embraced the power of social media? I would love to hear how you embrace the power of social media and marketing. Sure, uh, that is uh, kind of the domain of, of my partner, Anita. Uh, but I do know, uh, so when we rolled out into Walmart and when we rolled out into Kroger, uh, she targeted those specific areas, uh, finding shoppers that live within you know, X amount radius miles from these stores. Uh, that they liked these stores, that they had demographics that would fit with the shoppers we were appealing to, uh, and really worked on driving them into the stores to make that purchase. Another question here in the front. Yeah, I wanted to uh, say congratulations. Uh, your story is fantastic. I think it's a story that all of us need to hear. Um, what I'd like to ask you is, through the journey, could you just share with us some people in your life that were advocates and mentors for you through this whole process, and then share with us some people that were really maybe the opposite of that, some people that really kind of grinded on you and maybe disappointed you, thinking you thought these people would support me and they're really not even supporting me. So could you kind of give us both sides of that? I think that would help us. Sure, uh, and I'm, I'm glad you asked that because our company wouldn't be where we are right now without people helping us out. Uh, like I said, Pam Bernikin with Altera Bank was an advocate for us. Uh, Denise Fields with the UMKC Small Business Center was a mentor to me. Uh, gave me a lot of tough advice and sometimes <laughs> tough love and told me things I didn't want to hear but that I needed to hear. Uh, so I'm incredibly grateful for her. Uh, Rick Kreska, who I mentioned earlier with Ink Cycle, uh, was a mentor with me and, and gave me good advice. Uh, and actually, even where we're office at right now, the uh, KU Med Biosciences Building, uh, Frank Cruzy, who was the head of that. Uh, gave me good su suggestions, but just gave me a lot of positive feedback, a lot of positive reinforcement. Because uh, like I, I mentioned earlier, it, it helps when you've got people in your corner. Uh, and of course, my, my wife, uh, if I didn't have her, the, the business wouldn't be anywhere. Uh, she had a, a full-time day job, and when we first started selling the product, uh, she would stay up with me until 2 or 3 a.m. packaging these mighty handles for Amazon. Uh, we used to use these crappy beaded zip ties to keep them together. And after you did about a thousand, they'd start cutting your fingers open. So we'd be wearing cheap gloves using zip ties at you know 3 a.m. Uh, as far as uh, people who grinded on me, I'm I'm a big believer that you know everything is part of the journey. You know, someone asked me, you know, what, what what would you change? I wouldn't change a single thing. You know, because when everything's going good. You know, when business is coming in and we're landing new accounts and we're executing well, you know, I'm not growing as a person. I'm not learning as an entrepreneur. You know, it's when the kind of the funky stuff happens, you know, we figure out how to deal with this uh, and, you know, how to get better from it uh, that I think uh, as business people that we really grow. Uh, so I, you know, I've been grateful for the good and, and maybe grateful for the not so good people too. 
question here on your, on your left. Um, you mentioned uh, a cool statement uh, just a little while ago that three years and now seven figures, I think is what it was. Would you want to expand on that a little bit more? Tell us kind of how you got there in, in that short period of time. Uh, without going into too much detail, that, that's just what our, our revenues are. Uh, for our company, uh, we sell products uh, that we need to have large turns in order to be successful. Uh, in order to do that, uh, we have to be in the, the largest retailers in the U.S. Uh, and so uh, the way that we got in there was, I, I think, number one, we had a good product uh, that fits a need uh, and helps serve consumers well, uh, but also hard work. Uh, probably been blessed a little bit and uh, you know, a hell of a lot of the luck, too. So. Uh, Probably those four things kind of combined to get us where we are. And what would you say would be the next step? Like in, in terms of scale, mm -hmm. how would you accomplish that? And what would be the goal for scaling? Uh, well, we have uh, two new product lines uh, that we are working on rolling out into our retail partners this year. Uh, we haven't finished selling them in yet, so I, I don't want to uh, kind of speak to what they are. Uh, uh, but our goal is to keep a a very flat, lean organization. Uh, you know, we want to focus on doing the things that we feel like we have some skill and expertise in, and then you know, non-critical functions outsource those things. So uh, we will grow an employee count, but uh, my goal is to keep things lean so that we're nimble and, and can operate efficiently. Here we, we got go. one in the back, walking quickly. Here we are. Hey. Uh, First of all, congratulations. And second, uh, my, my challenge whenever I do groceries things is I, I try to grab them all at once, mm -hmm. bring them all in. It's been my challenge since I've ever shopped. So your thing might make it too easy, and now it's not challenging, so I might just keep doing it. But I'd actually like to hear about Mighty Green, your, your, your overall company, and talk about the vision for that company, kind of maybe talk about what's next. Um, and how does Mighty Handle fit into the Mighty Green landscape? Sure. Uh, with, with Mighty Handle, uh, you know, every product has a life cycle, and we don't know what the life cycle of this product is. It might be two years, it might be five years, you know, it could be something beyond that. So in the meantime, in order to really grow the company, we have to continue uh, to develop new products uh, that kind of go back to what our, you know, our, our core value is creating products that make life better for consumers. Uh, we have uh, a couple different products uh, that we have right now that are gonna be launching under the Mighty Green umbrella uh, this year. Uh, since we haven't finished selling them into our retailers yet, I, I can't really speak to them, because uh, until they can tell you when they're gonna be on shelves, they, they really don't want you to disclose that information. Uh, but as far as what Mighty Green is, uh, my goal, and I, I think you know, I, I speak uh, for Anita as well. Our goal is to build a, a strong Kansas City company uh, that we can be proud of, uh, that we can provide real value uh, to our consumers, real value to our employees, and then lastly, real value to our, our shareholders. Uh, you know, I said if, if we can just keep doing the next right thing, you know, I, I think we've got a chance to be successful. I have one more thought slash question, something for you to walk away with and, and see about how you can make it congruent. Your company's name is Mighty Green, mm -hmm. and tell me again what your mission statement is. So you're... Making life better for consumers and shoppers across the country. Okay, when I hear Mighty Green, I'm thinking of you know, the whole green movement. So my suggestion for you would be to incorporate to make it congruent, because in the mind of the consumer, when we hear Mighty Green, we're thinking, oh, this is something, we're gonna use reusable bags, we're gonna, you know, there's gotta be some component of green in there. And so you might wanna explore that because right now there's a little bit of a disconnect. Ben has a question here in the middle. Hey, um, so I think every, probably everybody has ideas all the time, you know, about inventions. Hey, it'd be cool, you know, getting out of my car, this or that. Um, but it never, it's really rare that somebody takes that and actually does something with it. And so I think that says something about you and your team. Um, what do you think 
it is about your background or, or, or yourself that kind of gave you that, that push to, to go ahead and say, hey, I have this idea, let's actually put this in Walmart? You know, my, my background is uh, uh, my undergrads in, in business school from the University of Missouri. Uh, you know, so I'm, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a designer. Uh, I'm a simple-minded guy, so if it's something that I can figure out and it can make my life easier and better, I think that can appeal to the shoppers as well. Uh, the thing that's allowed us to be successful is, is our team. Uh, like I said, I'm, I am, uh, I'm not the smartest guy in the world by any means, uh, but I work with people that are extremely talented. Uh, so I, I think that's something that really focus on having that strong team, because uh, there will be ups and downs. Uh, but having that strong team to rely on, not just to fall back on when things are bad, but to really rely on to execute when things are good. All right, we got one to your right, the wonderful Grant Gooding. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm, I'm personally interested, and I'm sure there are other retailers in the room that are interested in your experience in dealing with Walmart, because while top line is great, it becomes a margin race at that time. And generally, it's not only a margin race, but it's a slippery slope. So can you talk about your experience in, in having to manage costs in order to make sure you get into Walmart, and then how you've adjusted to that from an operational and product perspective? Sure. Uh, I, I think that is a... Uh I don't want to say misconception, but that is something that a lot of people think about Walmart, big box retailers, is their only focus is driving your margin you know, down in the dirt. Uh, when we first got in, we had a sales call with their SVP of Impulse Products. And one of the first things he said was, I want you to make money on this. Don't try to price this to us where you guys are not going to be successful. Uh, and once we got in, uh, we have been their highest selling Made in the USA Impulse product. Uh, so they, uh, they have not really leaned on us as far as driving down price. Uh, I can just speak from my own experience, uh, but they have been an incredible partner. Uh, without no Walmart, I'm not standing here. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, can't, I can't speak to other businesses because I, I, I know that that experience is out there and it's out there probably in spades. Uh, but in my experience with working with them, they have been an ideal partner, uh, especially to help us grow the business. All right, the last classic One Million Cups question, second time around, what can we as a community do to help you? Keep building great businesses. Uh, you know, uh, keep working on bringing great ideas to market, uh, keep supporting the entrepreneurial community, and uh, most importantly, uh, go to Walmart and buy a mighty handle. So, <laughs> thank you. Let's give Ben a round of applause. Thank you, Ben. Uh, just a couple of quick uh, announcements. And if you haven't grabbed one of the announcement sheets, please grab one there. They're in the back um, near the coffee and water. There's so much information on these um, that we'd like you all to be aware of. Just a couple of quick things. The Coworking Wednesdays Sprint Accelerator is today. If you've got no plans after this, we'd love to see you there. Um, creating a resilient brand, also a Sprint Accelerator. That's 11 uh, a.m. to 12.30. Casey Roundtable uh, Breakfast, it's coming up on the 4th from 7.30 to 9 at et cetera. Think Big Thursdays, uh, Collisions and Coffee is the 4th from 8.30 to 9.45 a.m. at Think Big. Um, and also the ABCs of an Angel Investment is on February 4th at the ECJC. Again, grab one of these flyers, tons of great information on there. Um, as we move things along, we'd like to actually welcome back to the stage one of our alumni, Jonathan Bender with Recommended Daily. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Thanks, Milton. Can you guys all hear me in back? Cheers. So my name is Jonathan Bender. I'm the founder of Recommended Daily. We are a digital media company that specializes in coveraging the Kansas City food and drink scene. So today what I wanted to do was tell you a little bit about where we've been since we launched in December of 2013, tell you a little bit about how we make a living and uh, employ people here in Kansas City, and then also get a sense of what it is that you'd like to hear more from us. So when we launched, we launched because I am a journalist who looks at the world of journalism and recognizes that it's an industry in a state of flux. So if you can imagine me, I am somebody who really wants to practice journalism for the rest of my life, 
but when I look at our current media landscape, a lot of that media landscape is telling me that that is not a possibility, uh, that newspapers are dying or dead, uh, depending on who you ask. And so in my mind, the goal was to recreate the newspaper model. And so the way we did that was by launching digitally first. Uh, and it's been a great success in terms of both the response and then also what we've been able to achieve. And so I wanted to tell you a little bit about who reads our publication. Um, just so you know, we are a true news publication in that we don't publish reviews. A lot of what we do is about new or upcoming food and drink producers. It's feature stories about the people who are making or serving your food or farming here in Kansas City. Uh, right now, we average between 10 and 20,000 unique visitors a month and probably about twice that in page views. Our demographics split pretty evenly between male and female. You'll also notice there's a, a pretty even split between Kansas, Missouri, the Midwest, uh, and then our age range is about 25 to 44 is our sweet spot. Now, what was interesting to me is it sort of proved that the people who are interested in food news aren't one particular kind of person, uh, people of all ages. Food is sort of our great connector in that if I start talking to you about your favorite sandwich or cocktail or wine, we can have a really long and wonderful conversation that ends up being not divisive. A lot of what we talk about now can be polarizing, uh, but when you talk about food, if you tend to disagree, it's a really lovely disagreement uh, because you're gonna spend a long time telling me why you think this is the best meatball, and I'm really gonna enjoy that conversation. Now in terms of how we're structured, uh, how we actually make money, one of the key, key ways for us has been content partnership. So there are established media companies. As someone who was a regular freelancer for the first five years in which I lived here in Kansas City, I've established relationships with editors around the city. One of the great partnerships that we've had has been with Kansas City Public Television. Uh, they have a digital property called Flatland. So back in October, we did a five-part video series and that was called Today's Special. And the idea was to introduce you to tastes and taste makers here in Kansas City. Now for me, that provides me another platform in which to tell stories. You know, we don't have a large scalable operation, so to have the support of an established institution that has videographers and editing bays and all of the things that you need to produce really high quality video content was important to me, but then it also allowed me to identify some stories that we could tell in new ways. Events have been the true backbone of the Recommended Daily. It's part of the reason I'm still standing before you today, and then also one of the ways that we were able to build our brand really quickly. So on the left side, you'll see some of the past events we've done. We did On a Stick, uh, which actually I talked about the last time I was here in August of 2014, and that was a chef-themed take on state fair foods. We held Knife and Pork, uh, which was a craft butchery festival with the local pig in the East Bottoms in 2014 as well. And then last year at Crown Center, we partnered with Chick Events, who was here, I believe actually last year, and it was a handmade shopping and vintage experience that we paired with tasting booths. Um, on the right-hand side are our next two events, so if you don't have plans for Valentine's Day, Joe's Kansas City is going to host a stock broth and bowl cookbook dinner on February 12th, and Rye is hosting a cookies and beer party on Saturday, February 13th. Now that brings me to the next component. Uh, so one of the things that has been really interesting to me, I think when you're an entrepreneur, you have a sense of what you think your business is gonna be. The last time I was here, by this time I'd predicted to this crowd that we would have a print publication to match our digital publication, but we've done a pretty big pivot. And also part of what I've realized as an entrepreneur is that you need to not be locked into what you think your business is going to be but instead you need to recognize what your business is actually becoming or going to be. And so part of new media landscape, people discuss personal brand journalism. And it's this idea that at the heart of every media company is one person that you can identify as the central core component, and the person who gives that vision or creativity to the company. Now for me, that was a concept that I uh, shied away from initially, but I've also realized that if I'm the founder and the person who is the creative vision behind a company, I need to embrace that. And part of that, I think, came in with this idea of uh, books. So as a result of our events, we did a, an event that paired cookies and beer uh, that led to a publishing deal with Andrews McMeal here in town, where in which we wrote a cookbook. 
called Cookies and Beer. And so actually at this moment, I'd like all of you to either reach under your seats or look at seats around you. There's two manila envelopes in the room. I'd like you to find them, please. So reach under your seats, see if you can find them. Uh, if you find them, hold them up, please. Well, cheers. So um, this is my little Oprah moment. Uh, we're not a big company. So if I was Oprah, you'd all be having something under your seats. But I'm not Oprah yet. Um, so there's actually a copy of Cookies and Beer and Stock Broth and Bowl which is a, a cookbook that is actually about stock that features recipes from Alex Pope of the local pig and Todd Schulte of the Genesee Royale. So please take those home, courtesy of Recommended Daily, and the rest of you will have to get your own um, until we scale up to become Harpo Entertainment. But all of these things have proven to be interwoven. So when I look at books and events and also that, the last component has been advertising and sponsorship which is a traditional way in which media companies exist. So we have done both sponsored posts as well as traditional advertising campaigns. The idea is to be both open to it, but recognize that based on the fact that we're a digital company, that's always going to be a smaller portion of our revenue. And in part, that's a conversation where in which I, I believe it's, it's good to have. It's important to talk about why this is supported by advertising and why we need advertising, but it's never gonna be the main thrust of why we exist. And so with that, I'd like to open it up to questions. I'm really excited to tell you more about what the Recommended Daily is going to be doing, and thank you for having me here. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, great presentation. We're gonna hand it off actually to our panelists, but a quick question before we do that. So what, what would you recommend for lunch today? Ooh, that's a great question. <laughs> what, do you, what do you feel like eating? Like, do you wanna go light or heavy? I'm thinking heavy. Ooh. All right, um, then to me, if you really need a heavy sandwich, uh, Char Bar was re recently featured. Uh, Michael Simon has a show called Burgers, Blues, and Barbecue, uh, or Brews and Barbecue, and he featured their burnt ends sandwich that's just a big, sloppy, multiple napkin mess. Uh, now you're talking. Dive in, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. I concur with that recommendation, by the way. Um, First of all, great presentation. Um, one little thing you could do is, you know, have an envelope under the panelist chair. That would have been helpful. Um, you've done a great job of, you know, talking about the lessons learned since the last time that you were here. Kudos to you um, for being willing to share those. Um, and knowing that you need to stay nimble and that you need to listen to your customers. Um, where? Where do you think you're going? I know that you had an idea of where you were going last time and you've taken a complete pivot, um, but where do you think you might go next? Sure, um, I think for me, the, some of what I've seen with the opportunity to tell story in a lot of different ways is where we wanna be. So I'm a writer at heart, but I recognize whether it is via radio or video that there's a lot of opportunities, particularly online and based on the way that people digest content. So to me, I think it's being more responsive to how people want to see things, whether that's through photos or video or radio. And my instinct is we'll roll out some new content partnerships uh, in the second half of this year that I'm really excited to introduce. Thank you so much for bringing up the point about the fear around making your face the face. Because I, I'm always looking for faces on websites and I, I don't see them and I wanna know, like that's what connects me to um, a brand, is the, the, the faces, not just these stock f f uh, photographs. Um, I, I wanna treat the rest of you to something he didn't talk about today. By the way, awesome presentation. It had some numbers in it, that was great. He talked a lot last night at his Lego event about why he's in Kansas City. And if you don't know, you need to know why he chose to be here with us. Would you share that with the audience? Oh, sure. Um, I love my wife. She's... <laughs> That's always going to be the primary reason. Um, but attached to that was the idea that we could have a family and we could have a very great quality of life here in Kansas City. Uh, we moved from Brooklyn, New York. It'll be eight years this summer. And what I think we realized together was this idea of uh, she works in the public sector. Um, I am in journalism, which is traditionally not a particularly well-paid industry, and yet there were no sacrifices or compromises here in Kansas City. We could have everything we wanted. I mean, I think it doesn't hurt that we have children who are four and six, so we don't go out as much as we would like to, but we're not missing anything. 
And in addition, I think there is this opportunity that Kansas City is this beautifully welcoming community. And Kansas City loves and supports Kansas City in a way that no other city does. And I say that without, uh, I mean, any affect or really the idea that this should be a cynical thing. It's this beautiful component of where we live that this is a city that really wants to see the people here succeed. And that, to me, is a great reason to live here. Thank you for that. Now, here's my real question. What does Kansas City need to do? I'm going to flip this, and I'm going to ask you for your opinion. As an entire city? Or just... as, as a city who needs to work together, and we know we need to work together, what's, what's our next move? Oh, I think you need to start bragging. I mean, to me, there is this concept of we need to be humble and just work hard and not toot our own horn. I'd start tooting it, I mean, loudly and proudly, and particularly outside of the city. Because the idea that I can still get a reservation almost anywhere in the city anytime I want is amazing to me. And the idea that there are a number of creative people whose vision extends beyond Kansas City, but probably whose reputation doesn't, uh, it speaks to me that there is this real need that we just start, we start bragging a little. Thanks. Sure. I've got a question here to your left. Is, uh, number one, is there a chance we actually have too many restaurants? Short, no. Uh, okay. I mean, I think you have too many chain restaurants. Um, but if you're looking at the current landscape, I actually think you're on the beginning of a tremendous upswell of owner, operator, independent restaurants. There's been a wonderful trend, and it's part of the reason it's been really easy to live here in Kansas City, of folks who are chefs, who have gotten training in other cities, who have worked at world-class restaurants, who then come back and open up their own vision in a place like Kansas City, because in Williamsburg, it might cost you $2 million to launch a restaurant, and you can do it for a lot cheaper here in Kansas City. The one thing, I came here in 1971, and Companies like Hands had just started and things like that started right after I came. And you saw the, uh, the kind of the franchise world, you know, take off in, in Kansas City, you know, love Gilbert Robinson and the people that, you know, ran it and everything else. But it seems like today, now we see these clusters of restaurants where they do one very successful restaurant. Then they go do something completely different and then completely different. And there's groups of them that are putting this together. And we've got a place out in Phoenix, and the same thing's going on there, where they literally put, the same guy might have three restaurants or four restaurants on one street, all different. How do, everybody tells me restaurant business, toughest business to be in. How do they do it? How can you run so many different brands? And I, sorry, um, I think it's this idea that if you are able to figure out what the successful component of a given restaurant is it can apply to different concepts. I mean, a lot of what it means to be a successful restaurateur is understanding what your costs are, understanding where you lose money, and then knowing your customer what people want. So I, I think in part, we as a culture always want something new and interesting and fun. So the idea of creating different concepts uh, may not be as uh, foreign as it sounds, where in which somebody who has found an ability to succeed in one particular genre or ethnicity of restaurant can open something else because in part they figured out how to manage a restaurant in general. Uh, my name's Holmes Osborne, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur and uh, I owned a restaurant in a small town and it didn't work out but I, I still own the building. So I found out the other day the tenants, they owned a little Mexican restaurant and they failed. So I'm kicking around the idea of whether to do the restaurant again, and it's, it's extremely difficult because there's so many moving parts. You've got liquor, you've got uh, labor, you've got licensing, you've got the health department, you've got food, you've got customers, you've got weather. I mean, so when it's zero degrees outside for three weeks, nobody comes in. When it's 110 degrees outside for the entire month, nobody comes in. But having said that, if I do decide to do this again, it's only going to cost me $6,000. And retail, uh, retail by the drink license in the state of Missouri is with a Sunday license all together, all ends about 1200 bucks. I know someone in LA who owned a building and they had to pay 75 grand for, for a liquor license. And that was just to keep the liquor license for the building. They weren't even the restaurateur. So the beauty of doing it in Missouri, and it's still challenging, is you can do it on a shoestring budget and still make it. 
Good luck. Here in the front. Jonathan, are you so uh, up on it all that you know about a restaurant that doesn't seem to open called Cacao? It's at 95th and Knoll. I think Feast Magazine just wrote about it, that it'll be right. open. But why don't they open? There's a wide variety of delays. In their particular case, I don't know the reason, but it could be permitting or funding or they're refining their concept or they're just changing the paint color. Maybe they're waiting for their sign to arrive. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you knew it, Jonathan, but apparently you are the resident expert on everything Kansas City restaurants, so now, now you know. We got one over here to your right. So you said you think Kansas City's ready for that sort of explosion of uh, locally owned restaurants and bars and that sort of thing. For the people that are behind those concepts, a lot of them are working on those small budgets, and uh, what advice do you have for people that want to chase that dream and uh, want to build that name for themselves, get their get the word out about their, their brand and, and build something locally. I think some of what's been successful in recent years is we've had a series of pop-ups where in which established restaurateurs are bringing in people who they know or who are younger chefs who have a vision but don't yet have the ability to own a brick and mortar shop. So it's the opportunity to test out your market. You know, tonight actually at um, the Columbus Park Ramen Shop, there's going to be a pop-up called Bun Brothers. It's steamed buns. And so there you have a place, the Columbus Park Ramen Shop it is down in um, Columbus Park just off the River Market. They're not typically open on Wednesday nights, but they'll open for dinner to allow these guys to try out their steamed bun concept. And to me, that's a great example of an established business opening up the doors and letting somebody both introduce a new concept to their own customers, but then see what people actually think of the food they're making. Got a question in the back to your left. Hey, Jonathan, congrats. Um, I'm gonna take it off the restaurant topic and go more in the tech web space of what's a, a tool or a trick or some kind of hack you figured out that's helped you guys? Because uh, there's so many moving parts and applications you can use to track your website performance or newsletters. So just something that you found really helpful. Sure. Um, I, to me, it's been to focus on true organic growth. Uh, so a lot of what we do is probably counterintuitive. Uh, you'll see only you know, one or two posts on Facebook or Twitter that are actually tied in directly to stories. We've had tremendous response, and then in addition, the people who follow us on social media are actual people. So I know when I send something out that we'll get both a tremendous response and then a pretty quick uptick if it's a really interesting piece of news. So, to me, I think people get really focused and bogged down on building giant, big numbers and are really concerned about having huge lists, whereas I'd actually rather have a very dedicated core of foodies and hardcore people who know that if they really want to be on top of things, that we're where they start. Okay, so we have clearly seen in this room how you could, in the blink of an eye, become the resident expert on Kansas City's food scene. Um, and you could be hit up for lots of input and advice that nobody's paying you for. So um, talk a little bit more about how this is monetized, how you're making money. Advertising, you said, wasn't a primary focus, but how does it not be? I want to talk about the money. Sure. Because everybody needs to get paid for their expertise, which clearly you have. Well, today is free. You know, the next one is not. <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> For me, I, I think the, the big thing that you have to focus on sometimes is saying no, that you're correct. There are opportunities where someone will talk about it's additional exposure, it's the chance to grow your brand. Uh, but for me, having that power of saying, you know, this doesn't make sense for me, whether it's financially or as a time commitment. Um, but you're right. I mean, that's one of the aspects that I'm looking at for my business. Right now, currently, I am the full-time employee. I'm the founder. Uh, and we have a network of freelancers that we work with. And my goal is to pay them a fair market rate and then also find ways to bring them into the fold in greater numbers. And to do that, we obviously need to grow uh, both our revenue streams and then where we're going. So uh, it's an indirect answer to your question. But I, I do think that is one of the great challenges, particularly in the media space and the online media space, where in which things are expected to be free how do I convince you to pay for something? Who do you need to be connected to to solve that problem? Uh, to me, probably that is one of the arenas that I'm looking at for my business. I probably need a dedicated money person. So in other words, I get to have the creative conversation. You guys really like talking to me and asking me questions about restaurants, and then I'll have 
someone who's in a more full-time capacity who you then go to and you work out those business terms. Jonathan, question in the back for you. Yeah, I was, geez, that's fun. I was just kind of wondering what are the most popular stories? What do you get hit up for the most? What trends the best? Is it big name chefs? Is it the new hot bar? What, what do readers like? Yeah, it's a, a wide mix. I mean, part of what I try to do is not focus on specific stories, because I think if you play that game, it could drive you crazy. But to give you an example of some of the stories that have been popular recently, we had a story this week about baconated coconut, uh, which is bacon for vegans. So in other words, you're eating coconut that has the taste, smell, and general flavor of bacon, smoky and salty and fatty and sweet. It's by a company named Mean Vegan, uh, and they're selling it one more cup. That, to me, was a great hit. Um, but then on the flip side, you also have stories. There's a bar called Lucky Boys that opened in the West Bottoms, uh, and they're serving hot chicken um, and kind of deliciously cheap craft beer. And so it really ranges. Part of it seems to depend on something that people haven't heard of or are interested in. Um, and then in part, it's tied into food trends. So if things are uh, currently attached to something that is gluten-free uh, or vegan, uh, there is a real interest and in, pun slightly intended hunger for it. Right in the middle here, Jonathan. Hi, Jonathan. Hi. Um, so talk a little bit about, so you've got an ever-evolving product line. Talk about the creative process and where you get the inspiration for that next thing down the line. So that's been some of the things that have been the most fun for me with the Recommended Daily, particularly on the event side, is this idea to bring together people to do really unique collaborations. Uh, so I'll, I'll let something out of the bag, and you guys won't tell anyone, and it'll be great. Um, but currently in development, uh, I'm going to pick up uh, Christopher Elbow is working on uh, beer-flavored ice cream. Um, and I'm going to take him over to Dolce Bakery this afternoon, and we're going to pair cookies. And we're going to make beer ice cream sandwiches uh, that you can then get at Beer Station, because this is the third anniversary of when we did Cookies and Beer, which was the initial event that we launched with that then became a cookbook that you can have on your shelf. Uh, and so for me, I really wanted to keep doing something different. And that speaks to some of the openness and kind of fun of Kansas City right now, is you can approach people in the community and you can tell them, this is my idea. And their immediate response is, OK, uh, how do I be involved? And it's wonderful. Uh, and then it also creates these really fun partnerships that don't exist anywhere else. It's a one night only kind of thing. Got a question for you here to your left in the middle. Yes, hi. Um, I thought that she asked my same question, but I didn't quite get the answer. You know, I, I picture you doing wonderful work sitting at your computer and you inform people and I'm thinking, what puts money in the bank for you? I mean, how do you monetize what you're doing? I mean, you're doing great things for the businesses and things like this. You don't do it for free, right? So tell me the answer you want, and I will tell it to you. <laughs> it's, it's, okay, it's, what, I'm kidding. You, you're doing it because it's your passion, and you don't care if you make many money. Oh, right? no, right? I mean, that, that to me. I mean, that's what, that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> There you sound like a dad. You know, do you, are you passionate about it or do you want to make money? Um, I, I mean, one of the ways that we have, we have really found success is through events. Events are a clear and, and easy um, way in which to both galvanize the community and then also generate some revenue. Advertising and sponsorships, although I glossed over those at the end, uh, those have been lucrative for us from day one. Part of it is by running a digital organization that is also primarily freelance, you know, we do a really good job of maintaining our cost structure. Um, and so as a result, what we need in order to be successful, this has been revenue generating from day one. And that was part of the reason that I launched as a digital product, was my goal was not to invest a lot of money in a new media company before I knew where my revenue was going to come from. Jonathan, we've got a question for you in the middle here. Hey, Jonathan, I wanted to ask you about one specific part of your presentation where you talked about adapting to what your business was becoming as opposed to what you thought it would be. That really spoke to me because that's something I feel like I'm learning the hard way in a lot of ways in my own business. So I just wonder if you would tell us, you know, what are, um, 
for those of us who are experiencing that, what would you say are some, ta I think one of the things I've been challenged with is knowing, you know, is this really what my business is becoming? Um, and if so, is that really the direction I want to go? So what, uh, what would you say to us if we're experiencing that or some good tactics to kind of figure that out and figure out the right direction to go to respond to what's, what's happening with our business? I think you're going to live with your business. I mean, if you're an entrepreneur, you could put an infinite amount of time into what it is that you're doing. You're passionate about it, and you want to spend the time building that business. So while you're doing that, part of what you need to ask is, is this who I want to be in partnership with? And is this what I enjoy doing or the reason I founded the business? And if you can answer both those questions with yes, then to me, you can pursue that avenue, even if it's not something you initially thought that you would want to be doing. I mean, if you had asked me that cookbooks would result from doing an event that paired cookies and beer, uh, you know, I would have told you that I, I didn't think that was necessarily one of the outcomes that would happen. But as a writer and somebody who wants to write for a living, to me that is a glorious sort of boon as a result of what's happening. And the second book, Stock, Broth, and Bowl, initially started as an idea because I wrote a story for Kansas City Public Television, which is one of our content partners. So that's a paid story that generated revenue for our company. My editor at Andrews McNeil saw that story, had been interested in doing a book on that topic, asked for a pitch for a book on that topic, and that resulted in a second book deal you know, in the span of three months. And so to me, it was a very small opportunity where in which it was doing one story that happened to be about the bone broth trend in Kansas City. It was something that I thought was on topic and people were going to be interested in talking about. And then after that story ran, you know, nine months later, there's a cookbook on the shelves that's attached to that. So some of it has to do with the idea of pursuing what it is that you want to do. But then when someone else says, hey, is this something that you would be willing to adapt that idea to, figuring out whether it fits in with your core sense of who you are. Got one on your right here for you. Hey, Jonathan, thank you for the presentation. Um, I really like your brand and the, um, the idea. As I'm thinking about it, I'm having kind of a hard time imagining uh, how it would grow into bigger. <laughs> uh, what are your plans for growth? Sure. Uh, it's a good question. I, part of where we can grow is through sponsored content and things that are on that true business side. The business development component is probably where I think there is the significant growth potential in regards to being a, a true business structured with large sets of employees. You know, when I look at the media side or the creative side, to me, that is the arena which exists to both inform people about what we're doing and then also is because I what I enjoy doing. But I think if you look at what we're going to be doing from a business component, my instinct is over the course of this year, you would see us do more on, on what I would consider to be a true business side and whether that is in the retail environment or something that is an extension of our brand that is logical. You know, part of what we discussed earlier when somebody was asking about being online and social media, right now I believe part of why people are so receptive to us is we're not selling a lot of things. You know, if you're coming to an event, you're coming for that experience. It's not a true sales transaction. So we've never actively monetized that social media base and base that we have. But I think we've built enough trust with the people who read us to begin to do that a little bit more. Very good, and Jonathan, as always, one last question for you. What can we as a community do to help Recommended Daily? Sure, this one is more of a general um, request. So what I want you to do is pay creatives fair market value. So the next time you are at an art fair or you're talking to somebody about graphic design or your company is bringing somebody in, if they quote you a number that is too high for your business uh, to wrap its head around or you to wrap your head around. You can still say no to that transaction, but I want you to stop bargaining with creatives. Thank you. Thank you all for coming this morning. It's been a wonderful time. We had some great presenters. I want to encourage everybody to come back next week. And please, please bring somebody with you. Help us grow this community and really fill the room. And again, quick reminder, co-working Wednesdays at the Sprint Accelerator this morning. So head on over, and we'll see you there. Thanks, guys.